Good morning and welcome to today's broadcast, ladies and gentlemen. We're coming at you live from Los Angeles, California, and we've got some teams ready here in the Epic 8. They're ready to do some battle. I'm Manuel Grubby Schenkhuizen, and with me is Tim Trixler Frazier and Sean Day9 Plot. How are you guys doing? Oh, I'm great. I had to watch last weekend, but now I'm here. I'm ready to cast. I get the front row seat. I'm excited for the matches. Yeah, I'm glad to be here as well. I cannot wait. The matches today are going to be fantastic. Yeah, and uh, welcome to Heroes of the Dorm here, D9. It's so good to have you with us here. We're thrilled to have you here at the commentator's desk. I'm especially excited because of the scale of this tournament. I mean, it was 6,000 players. That's 880 collegiate teams down to eight, which means every single team here had at least somewhat of a brutal path. They've all been through the ringer, so we know the skill level will be high. Yeah, and as you at home actually know, Grubby and myself were here last Sunday watching this Super 16, and the games were awesome. Yeah, so far we've had some absolutely thrilling and amazing games here in Heroes of the Dorm, and now they're going to have to step it up one notch further in order to take it all the way, because they're going to be fighting to go ahead to the Heroic Four. And then they'll be moving on to the ultimate round, the grand final, where only one team will be able to call themselves truly the heroes of the dorm. That's right. Tons of awesome competition will be occurring, and our players have been working all week for today, the Epic Eight. They're going to try their best to pull out some crazy strategies, and I can't wait to see what they have up their sleeves. But guys at home, just know they are in it to win it. And the thing that makes this competition especially unique is that every single player is a current college student. Many of these players have been really struggling to both maintain their heavy course load and train for this tournament because the prize that's on the line is a massive one. Free tuition for your college career, all while playing Heroes of the Storm. So honestly, can't get much better than this. Yeah, that's the ultimate uh, dream there. And guys, we want to get you involved. We want to know what you're thinking. So why don't you hop on Twitter and tweet with the hashtag StormTheDorm and let us know what you're thinking. These players may be reading Twitter. They need your words of encouragement to maybe take it all the way. And of course, for any of you who are just tuning in, this might be your first esports broadcast. This might be the first time you've even heard of Heroes of the Storm. So don't worry. That's what our job is for, to break down all the strategies throughout the weekend with Grubby and I commentating at the desk, with Tim doing the expert strategies up on the replay desk. And what I want you to do is make sure to check out heroesofthedorm.com and also to watch this very new video about what is Heroes of the Storm. Welcome to Heroes of the Storm, Blizzard Entertainment's action-packed team brawler. Players can choose from a variety of Blizzard heroes, each with unique strengths and weaknesses, to create five-player team compositions that support versatile strategies. These strategies are then put to the test on a diverse set of battlegrounds, each with their own unique objectives. Hire the Ghost Pirate Blackheart. Summon a powerful Grave Golem. Every battleground is different and presents a unique environment for competition. However, the criteria for victory is constant. Destroy the opposing team's core. Heroes will grow in power and talent over the course of a single game as they take out minions, enemy fortifications, and of course, the opposing team's heroes. Your effectiveness at teamwork and collaborative play will make or break you. All right, today's Epic Eight teams will be fighting in best two out of three matches in the Heroic Four finals, uh, the semi-finals there. And from there on, there will be one ultimate round, the grand finals, from which only one team will emerge victorious and be able to call themselves the heroes of the dorm. Yeah, and I mean, I mentioned this earlier, these players have been through an absolutely brutal path to get here. Started with 880 collegiate teams, all the way down to eight, trying to get to the grand finals next weekend. And as we said before, some of you may be tuning in for the first time wondering, what was the path to get here? What have these players been having to go through? Tim, tell us, how did we arrive at this round of eight today? Well, day nine, remember last week we had the Super 16 occur and we watched a majority of matches all the, come down all the way to the Epic Eight. Now, if you weren't able to watch those games, don't worry, we're gonna catch you up. So let's go ahead and check out the brackets and see where exactly our teams are currently at. I know there was one map in, or one matchup in particular that I was actually enjoying very much and that's because we saw in an unorthodox murky pick. Right here in the top right corner, you had Indiana versus Rutgers. Indiana was able to make it forward. Of course, another match that is on everyone's radar, it was Kansas State versus California Berkeley. 
Berkeley. California Berkeley made it to the Epic Eight, and they are actually one of the highest voters voted teams actually in the uh, brackets. So we'll see how they do today in the Epic Gate. And then one personally for me that I'm looking at is Arizona State down here in the bottom left corner. They're actually uh, my chosen winners for the entire tournament. So I want to see where they're going. But Grubby, you had a match last week that you enjoyed very, very much. Care to enlighten us? Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of great games, but there was one in particular that stood out in Team UT Arlington versus ASU. Yeah. Co-Tank on the touch star there. I mean, I've only got one word for it, Force Wall. <laughs> That's right. Force Wall is a heroic that is a little unorthodox. We don't see it picked up often by players that pick up Tassadar, but of course, Arizona State University did it and it was epic to watch. So maybe we'll see some more matches actually in the Epic at 8 that actually have heroics that aren't chosen as often. So let's check it out. Who will you see today? In the top left corner, we have Boston College versus Western Ontario. We have Indiana versus Illinois. And then we have Cal California Berkeley versus Washington, which, by the way, neither team has lost a match yet or a game. So today, someone will have to, of course, go out. In the bottom left corner, this will be the game that we'll be starting with. Texas A&M versus Arizona State. And Daydine and Grubby will give you the lowdown on all the information about our teams. I mean, Texas A&M versus Arizona State really is the story of the underdog versus the undefeated team. Texas A&M really, I think, is one of the least voted teams to yeah. win the entire tournament. Arizona State University, one of three teams to be completely undefeated at this point. Let's take a look at Texas A&M, get a sense of their stats, how their team compositions get built out. And I think that the, the biggest thing that I think about with Texas A&M is really how low their specialist count is in terms of picks. Yeah, exactly. We see a very uh, solid distribution there between picking the assassins and the support. We see, of course, they already racked up three losses. That can be a learning experience in order to even improve your game for yes. the next round. Yeah, and of course, given how fragile the end games can be in Heroes of the Storm, one single mistake can be punished to the point where a lead is immediately blown, which makes of course, the stats of Arizona State University, even more mind-blowing. 20 and 0 are really the numbers that you need to know. <laughs> the, the, big, the big contrast, though, I mean, Tim, 40% pick rate of support. We know double support has been really popular yeah. these days. Arizona State understands the current set of the game right now, which is a number of supports, because supports are a little bit more flexible right now. There's some that bring in great damage. There's some yeah. that come in great initiation of team fights. And so they're utilizing that to their advantage, and you see that reflected in their numbers. So Arizona State, we'll see how they do against the underdog, of course, Texas A&M. Now, of course, these numbers are just part of the puzzle. The biggest decision point for these players when picking which heroes they bring to the battlefield is the battlefield itself. Tomb of the Spider Queen, an extremely intense map, will be the start to things. So as we head into the draft, really the players have to be asking themselves, how do they pick a composition that can be in those very regular team fights? Yeah, exactly. And one of the most flexible picks here in Arizona State is right to pick her up right away is Jaina. She's a damage dealer that will fit in pretty much with every composition. And Texas A&M, you see Vala being picked up here as that's a hero we've been seeing in almost every single composition. She's a great foundation for your comp. So we'll see what the second hero will be here for Texas A&M. Uh, but overall, already starting off to a pretty standard setup. And we have Sylvanas as the follow-up. Oh, Sylvanas, interesting. One of the newest heroes in the rotation. And, you know, there's a couple of big heroes, a couple of big mixtures like Illidan, like the Diablo Taronda composition that get picked very early. Vala Sylvanas Sylvanas has quite a bit of flexibility to it as we look over at Arizona State Diablo, one of the most popular tanks in the, uh, in, in the game right now, just due to his ability to engage quickly. This is interesting. They take Diablo and Tassadar. They didn't go for the diablo Taronda uh, combination that you right. rightly uh, uh, highlighted there, Sean. But part of that is that they apparently don't want Taronda, but they do want to make sure that the opponent cannot get Diablo and Taronda together. They are now going to go for Brightwing here. A great choice. Yeah, a fun follow-up here for Texas A&M. Sustaining hero here, where she has constant heals that are constantly fluctuating out of her body. So we'll have Brightwing here for the air healer, and then, of course, the follow-up into ETC, which is a great engager as a warrior. Yeah, I mean, honestly, everything makes tons of sense from the Texas A&M side. Going back to Arizona State, no surprise that Rhaegar is going to get picked up, quite honestly. Wow. One of the most wow. popular healers in the entire game, but... I mean, Grubby, I hear you already looking a little <laughs> shocked about the Falstad pick. Yeah, I mean, I know they need another damage dealer, but did not expect it to be Falstad. He has seen a little bit more play recently, and actually, that is an advantage. He doesn't get very widely played, yet picking him may give them a small little edge there in playstyle. He does make sense, though, against this composition now with Bala, Savannah, and Zagara, and Brightwing, all heroes that don't have very high health pools that can be taken up pretty quickly. But 
it looks like it's time to head into the battleground. Let's go ahead and check it out. Can you introduce our teams, uh, Day9? In the left side, in the blue trunks, is going to be Texas A&M under the name Team Maroon. And at the far opposite side, in the red trunks, Arizona State's Dream Team. Tim, the map is going to be Tomb of the Spider Queen. I'm ready to hear your thoughts on how this match is going to play out. Well, here's the mini map right here. Just so you guys know, there are three lanes. Heroes will have to move to the middle of the lanes and start absorbing gems. They'll take those gems and turn them in and get web weavers, which we'll explain a little bit more often as the game is about to be starting in two seconds. But yes, man, this game is all about high intensity. All right, and high intensity is what we will see. Normally, the beginning phase can be a very passive affair, but not on this map, guys. And action seems to be picking up immediately as all five heroes from both teams are in the middle. Not, you will see a very congested area here in the middle as the distance between lanes is so short. Yes, and absolutely, because laning is so key for collecting those gems to deposit for the Spider Queen, that is the core mechanism of the map. Even an early loss at the very early game where the cooldown to respawn is only a few seconds, losses like that can be so big on a map like this. Yeah, normally you have a spread of like two heroes per lane, one hero per lane, but here you should see all the lanes as one network, really, where you can just go up and down in just a jiffy and surprise the opponent and assassinate them when they least expect it. Now, I got to ask you, Tim, at this point in the game, walk me through the composition of Texas A&M. What's going to be their goals in the early game? Right now, they're playing a little bit early. They're going to be playing a little bit safe. You see them kind of guarding here, Revenge. So Vonis in the top lane, we'll go look at her really quickly. She has some decent escapes as well. And you see her staying by her green health bars, which are her allies, just staying around it, staying near turrets, so she's going to be safe. The real major thing is in the very far bottom lane, and that's going to be uh, Zagara. Zagara has these creep tumors you see right above her, actually, these little, little purple things that are going to give her a nice amount of map control and allow her to kind of spread that out. And you're going to see her try to put as many possible down, and it's on the red team, Kotank, and of course the other hero that's in the top right corner, to clear these as much as possible because they can spiral out of control. Now, I think that Zagara and Tassadar are actually first pick material here. We didn't see them picked up first in the draft, but Zagara offers so much for the team, which just goes above and beyond the amount of damage that she puts out. Those creep tumors, the vision they give is going to be very helpful to deny the enemy from turning in those gems. As we head to the middle lane, we see that this is where the bulk of the heroes are. This is where the tension is very high. Diabolo's charge and overhead throw to pick off a target is always a potential threat. And here comes Jaina and Diablo. They're looking for a chance to rotate down to the bottom lane. They're looking for any weak target, but this is great maneuvering by Brightwing and ETC on the part of Texas A&M to stay in safe positions. Malcor is going to get busted up a little bit here by Don't Kill Me K, but he's got his own methods of displacement and will be able to uh, make his getaway there. Yeah, I want to show you you guys really quickly here the blue team their main objective we can go up a little bit here and look at the spider's desk is this thing right here as you see it is currently the major point and focus point for their entire composition as they want to make sure they control that area so they can get the turn in so you'll see them constantly putting these creep tuber downs on the left and all that area to really just kind of really hold the entire objective Right now, we've just hit level four, which is the first tier of talents. These heroes are getting more and more powerful as the game goes on. And there's certain inflection points of levels where there is a spike in power. And just right now at level four, we see a Diablo's charge, overhead throw, but oh, Sylvanas with the excellent evasion manages to escape. Yeah, using her haunting wave ability there to make her escape. She can do this once every eight seconds. Ideally, as a team, you will try to make the opponent use that prematurely and then get her. She still had it available. It was a nice try. She almost went down. But there she was. Sylvanas made her getaway. Melkor now trying to pay seven gems here. Was successful. The interrupt from the opponent wasn't quick enough. And that's how quick it can go sometimes. I mean, as you're collecting gem, it is a liability to hold on to a lot. We see Rhaegar keeps getting denied. This is a great job by Texas A&M. I mean, right now. All Arizona State needs to do is stay calm, stay steady, and keep turning in gems. But if that gets denied, then all of a sudden, Texas A&M can get the first big push, which gives them control of the middle. Yeah, exactly. And uh, Tim, you want to explain us a little bit about uh, the mechanics of pushing a lane to the enemy's towers to deplete ammunition versus wanting to have easy pickup of the gems? Maybe a little bit later as a fight breaks out here. Oh, near Elite is in trouble. You see Brightwing taking a lot of damage there. Melkor trying to follow up, but Del Kill Me K might actually be taken down here. No, he will slowly get away, but overall, Arizona State is in a better situation right now. They have more health bars available to them. At this point, we also see that the level lead is ever so slightly in favor 
of Arizona State. Diablo still looking for pickoffs, still trying to push back. That next big inflection point is going to be at level seven. And we see again, tied six and six, it's neck and neck, but that first big burst that can happen at level seven could be the tipping point. Now you may ask yourself, why are they turning on all these gems? Who are they paying? They're actually playing a, a spider queen deity who, if you mollify her with enough gems, that is to say for now a total of 50 gems, she will summon web weavers in every three lane who will be fighting on your side and pushing the enemy fortifications. And they will prove to be very powerful aid in pushing the enemy forts. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing Falstad get a little bit low. Diablo continuing to stay at the front. Melkor has done quite an excellent job of being in good spots at the right time. The level seven just arrived for Arizona State University, but wasn't able to capitalize on anything notable. Everything really quick, guys, let's go ahead and check out the bottom lane and just see how Zagar is doing with spreading that creep. You see, she only has these mini tumors up here in the left top right corner. These are giving her vision. They're allowing her to kind of control the area overall. If we look at the mini map, they have vision of this entire area, which is very, very helpful. That's about a quarter of the entire mini map. So again, Zagar is doing well, um, even with the Dream Team doing their best to try and bring it all down. And really the funniest thing about this Zagara Tassadar thing that you bring up is look how many gems they have, <laughs> 24 to 27. This is a huge liability only now. Look at Zagara taking the perfect time to try to go up. But of course, Kotang not going to let it happen, doing his best to try to deny this turn-in. But it looks like Gosan is going to get the turn-in. One second, and he pays those 25 gems. And Web Weavers will now descend for the blue team, for Team Texas A&M. And the Web Weavers will travel exactly to the middle part of where the lanes meet. Yeah, really quickly. We'll go ahead and show you. They'll be heading down this way constantly, just going pushing all the ways at once. This is an important play for our team. Let's go and check out the Wave Weavers as they move across the middle of the map. Yep, those uh, dark clouds will spawn a Web Weaver and they will come exactly where the minion wave for the Blue Tomb is currently. Now, there's a number of different ways you can do it here, Day 9. You can group up together with one Web Weaver, or you can kind of keep the split that you've been entertaining in the early phases. And at this point in time, it very much so looks like Texas A&M is going to continue the split. Makes sense. They're trying to soak the experience for the important level 10 coming up. Web Weaver in the middle goes down at the top and bottom lane. The pressure is still on. We Noctis, see Noctis, Noctis gets Shadow Charge, gets overpowered and thrown over his shoulder. And they will take him down. Brightwing trying to save him there, but nearly it wasn't successful. Will pick up most of the gems, though, that Noctis dropped there. But yeah, I mean, this is the difficulty of this map. In Heroes of the Storm, on all the maps, you are trying to manage three tug of wars. We saw Sylvanas in the north get too over eager, move too far forward, and the same mistake might be happening down south Texas A&M. No, they don't want to let that happen. We see Kotank trying to hold down, trying to defend as best he can. But with the red team, Arizona State is starting to become a lot more mobile, starting to move from the top all the way to the bottom lane and in between. Yeah, and you've got to be mobile, guys. This is a team game. You've got to communicate to each other what's happening. Of course, you can keep an eye on what's happening but hearing from your teammates, hey, look, they destroyed the Web Weavers in the middle lane. They might be coming up soon. Be careful. Don't overextend. Oh, my God. Level 10 is about to hit. Uh, Tim, when both teams hit level 10, who's going to have the advantage in terms of well, these team compositions? The red team right now, because currently they're getting their own Web Weavers to push down the lanes. You can see them already here on the mini map heading forward here. So, yes, they will have the advantage because they have the pushing power of this map mechanic. Then they have the heroics. They have so much power right now. It's going to be really hard for Texas A&M to actually hold all of this. And I'm wondering how they're going to do it. Now, there is a strategic element here to when to use your heroic abilities. Use oh, them too no. soon. All right, they use the heroic ability there. Lightning Breath on Melkor, taking down enemy hero. It's now a five versus four situation. The Web Weavers are going to be that much more successful there. And they dropped a boatload of gems. This is a beautiful attack coming in from Arizona State, piling five heroes at the south, trying to force some response from Texas A&M. And the mistakes that were made cost two of their lives. And all of a sudden, we see the rest of Texas A&M coming down to the south. But don't forget, pushes are continuing in the mid, continuing in the north. The basic strategy of Heroes of the Storm is to apply pressure in multiple places at once. Exactly, divide and conquer. Even as the bottom threat by Arizona State was so potent, they have Rhaegar on AKA face here, pushing with that single Web Weaver, getting damage done on every fort. Ghost on, getting flipped over there, Force Wall. ETC will dive in, but what is he defending? He's already down. This I'm dive is very, very scary, actually. AKA face in trouble as well, but it looks like that everyone will pull away. But the major important thing to note is that we did have a major amount of damage done in these three areas of the map, which means later on, as we go into level 13, level 16, our players will be able to finally take those down, whereas the red team, Arizona State, has already secured one fort. Yeah, I mean, we saw 
the way that Arizona State capitalized on this push. They were a lot more aggressive, grouped five in one lane in contrast to Texas A&M that continued to keep their team split up. And what is the result? Arizona State is a full level ahead. Those inflection points are coming. Level 13 is the next big moment. Arizona State, that's right around the corner for them. So I like this play from Texas A&M. They're starting to get the minion encampments. encampments. They're getting the bruisers in the middle to, again, apply a little bit of counter pressure. And every time you kill an enemy hero, you gain some experience for your team. But more importantly than that, the enemy will have to yield map control to you, which is why we already have our second installment of Web Weavers here pushing down the lane. Now, you can see the strategy changed a little bit. They're, most of them are all here in the middle, re requiring a strong defense by the blue team. Yeah, right now, actually, with both the minimap, we do have the uh, bottom team pushing in with the Web Weavers up in this top left and the bottom right or the bottom left corner as well. And there's no one there to defend it because they're all forced to fight here in the middle. So all the pressure is stuck here. And Texas A&M a is forced to defend. Arizona State is getting free damage in the top and the bottom lane. And in fact, it looks like they may have just secured a fort. Yes, they have already secured one fort wow. right there. Level 13 to level 11, Arizona State seems to be confidently in control. But don't forget, Texas A&M has a number of heroic abilities that can turn the tides. One mistake, really, from either team is going to be massively um, uh, impactful. Just, yes, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a huge, huge issue. I like how the red team is threatening here, they're posturing. They don't actually need for a fight to happen here. During all this time, they're saying, we could go in. <laughs> but we're not going to do it yet, which forces the blue team to respond here and make the top and the bottom web weavers do maximum damage. Yeah, I agree with you, Grubby. Right now, the blue team, Texas A&M, has to make something happen. They're on the back end. They have the burden oh. of defense. Hey, Devouring Maul does go down at day nine. This is the big key if they can manage to pick off a single hero. No, Falstad gets eliminated. We saw the healing try to just barely save, but no. Uh, I mean, right now, ETC is trying to escape the force wall. Like you said, the very unusual oh. tower gets another kill. ETC is down the major tank, the major front line for Texas A&M is no longer there. We see Brightwing doing his absolute best to cause disengagement to help keep the team alive. But I mean, the devouring maw to pick off Falstad was excellent, but an equally good answer from Arizona I just want to point out really quickly here, while we have a small amount of moments where our teams regroup a little bit, just pulling up the mini map, you can see that the uh, red team is in a superior position right now as they've taken down two three forts right now compared to the only one over here on the right side here for the blue team. In terms of actual numbers, we have Arizona State in a great position. Yeah, and every time you take down a fort and towers, you gain extra experience points here. Now, it's not completely going to be a knock-on effect where there's no comeback possible, but as a team, you need to have uh, plan Bs for situations like right. these. Now, they have practiced dozens or hundreds or thousands of different situations here, Day9. So, uh, in order to stage a comeback, what kind of moves do you need to do with your team, you think, to get back in there. Well, I mean, really, there's a couple of key heroic talents. I mean, in particular, the Devouring Maw on Zagara. That can be such a game changer. Just having a single hero in a known location or being out of the fight for a few seconds. But you have to not take those engagements if you're on different talent tier levels. Right now, 13 and 15 on Still the same okay. tier and level. Yeah, once 16 comes, now all of a sudden, if you're Texas A&M, you have to be playing much more so on the back foot. So uh, as we're seeing, Texas A&M is just continuing to keep their team largely together to avoid that risk. And by the way, the red team, Arizona State, was kind of calculating that level 16 boost in power they get with their web weavers. They just secured a turn in with 60 gems. And you can see, as we're going to check out the core right now, we're seeing that all of these web weavers are starting to spawn. A third wave here for Arizona State, where it's only been one wave for the Texas A&M. They've Gotta get their stuff together right here, right now. Yeah, now all heroics are up for both teams, and it leads me to wonder, should they have let this happen? But that is behind us. All they can do now is try and take down the Web Weavers as quickly as possible. Perhaps an idea to go to the top one first that isn't um, defended by the red team there. T if Texas A&M can clear the top one, that's what Don't Kill Me K is doing. But I would like to see them all go together. The quicker you kill it, the quicker you can focus on the major threat, which is where ASU is pushing in together. And the major threat is going to be here in the very far bottom lane. The main objective here for the red team is to take out all of these turrets and the forts, which they'll be trying to do pretty soon here. And they're going to keep pushing. You see them? Well, we do have ETC in the top left corner, as mentioned, but he does have stage dive, which means he can dive in when there is needed. And there's some critical nice moves that Arizona State is doing, arriving just a few seconds. Oh, oh no! Oh, oh my god! Yet another force wall, but Diablo will get the overpower, but no, Rhaegar's healing is too much. We see Diablo trying to rose down Zagara. ETC gets taken down. 
shock and awe from Falstad. Still not enough to take down Zagara, but it is 5v4 right now. Arizona State continuing to apply pressure, going to try to eliminate this inner key. Now, Dana, you mentioned it, devouring ball from Zagara there. The Ghost Sun is one of the most important comeback mechanics. It missed entirely. It was a flop, and Force Wall nearly took down Zagara, but really, the point that happened here is that keep is down. And what happens in Heroes of the Storm, when you've lost a Ford and a keep in the same lane, the enemy team will start to uh, spawn catapults behind their minion waves. And this is going to apply a lot of pressure. They've got a ranged attack, and they have a longer range than any defensive structure. So the core will be under pressure, requiring mm -hmm. continuous defense. So what's happening right now is we're seeing Arizona State do one of the best things you can ever do in competitive gaming. When you have a lead, don't try to extend by taking a big risk. Just try to make sure you maintain it. They're pulling back. They're getting another encampment, which will help on, uh, again, the tug of war elements. They're going to try to get extra turn-ins. They're going to try to make sure the enemies don't get turn-ins, so there could be some sort of comeback potential. There are some potentially big plays available here for both teams, and that's like the huge boss mercenary in the very top northern position. If we can go ahead and go get a look at that right here. Yes, this bad boy right here. If any team can grab this neutral camp, it can help them either come back or, of course, in the game. So watch for that to be potentially grabbed pretty soon. That's also one of the greatest places to throw the match. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you're the team that is in the lead right now, Arizona State, you're seeing them, I think, very smartly not getting too over-eager with the boss. They're trying not to forget the core map mechanics. And of course, Melkor with 11 doing a good job uh, stockpiling them, but now is the good time for the turn in. Yeah, so now you'll see that they require 65 gems to be paid. It will ramp up every consecutive turn in. So even though you need more gems, yeah, well, you need more gems every time you pay. And I really like, oh, okay. I really like that they're not doing the boss yet. That is risky. And you just need to ask yourself in a situation like this, what could potentially make us lose the game here? Don't lose your cool. A constant balance and tightrope walking of your mentality. Don't get overconfident. Don't get intimidated. And it looks like Arizona is following these rules of thumb oh, just yeah. fine. Yeah, and, and I mean, despite all the movement, it's just very safe play, being very cautious, trying not to get too split up. I think what's really important right now is for the teams to get the lanes pushing forward, especially for Texas A&M. They want to get their lanes pushing forward in the top, middle, and the bottom. And at that point, after they do so, they can actually force a team fight. And I want them to do it before they get to level 20, Arizona State. If, if Arizona State gets to level 20 and they're still behind at this point, they're significantly behind. So now is the time to make a play. And you're going to watch for Gosan to make the play here as he has the Devouring Maw, which is a great heroic there to really force a team fight. Yeah, what I'm missing a little bit here is a setup to allow the Arizona State Dream Team to make a mistake there. There's very defensive play by Texas A&M, and I've just got to wonder, are they going to survive until they are level 20 with the opponent not finishing them off yet? Like, are they looking for the 20 versus 23 situation? Because right now, on the cusp of level 19 is ASU, and by just sitting back and defending, I don't think they're going to do it, Day 9. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, honestly, Texas A&M is the team that has to take a little bit of the risk, but the reward can be huge. There are so many gems stockpiled on all the rest of the team, and it looks like Texas A&M says the time is now. Uh, it looks like they wanted to go there, but at some point you just got to close your eyes and, and go go in and... Uh, oh, Falstad is getting a little bit out of position, He's but been doing that a lot. He's yeah. like trying to bait the enemy from like into, into following him further than do a barrel roll away. Oh, AKA Face doing a beautiful job of staying right in the middle of everything, knowing that Rhaegar's healing is often needed in, you know, a, a few milliseconds of window. So making sure Melkor, oh, starting to charge forward. How far to level 20? Still not quite there yet. We've got level 19.3 versus 17.2 right now. So if uh, the red team doesn't fight yet, they'll have an immense power spike here soon once they reach level 20. So ideally, they could win the fight, sure. They even have a better chance, but they don't necessarily want to risk it yet. Yeah, I mean, if you've been keeping track of some of the abilities, you'll see that some envenoms were used, a couple of the key pokes were used, Rhaegar easily chain heals, and the rest of Arizona State University pulls back. So now Texas A&M might be even a little more reticent to engage because they don't quite have the damage to do a big burst. I mean, right now, this is the time when Arizona State is saying, we're about to hit level 20. Let's get the boss pushing in the top lane because Texas A&M has really taken no initiative. Yeah, exactly. And uh, during this time, uh, Texas A&M is pulling back in anticipation of maybe getting assaulted here before the Webweavers descend. They got in defensive position, and that's kind of working against them now, as they didn't potentially take a chance there to do a backstab on ASU trying to get that boss. Oh my gosh. Like millimeters from level 20, and there it is. 
20 versus 17 Storm Talents are now in the hands of Arizona State. That will massively boost their heroic abilities. We're seeing the Force Wall go up. Doesn't manage to do very much. That's only four heroic talents remaining. Now watch for the Devouring Maul from Gosam. That's going to be the make or break situation. If the enemy team clusters up, there it comes. It misses fantastically. Oh, no. Gosam <laughs> getting taken down immediately. Oh, this is terrible for the blue team. The Force Wall from Tassadar, the shock and awe from Falstad immediately snipes <laughs> down two heroes. Two more remain. Oh. Five alive for Arizona State, losing no one. The boss, <laughs> the web spinners, and all of Team Arizona State University pummeling the core, really showing why they are 20-0 in oh, this tournament. Victory there. First match goes to ASU, and Texas A&M for now bites the dust. 21-0 and 0 is their overall score in this tournament. We'll see if they can continue that tr trend as we'll be going into game number two. But you've got to really look at the team, and the one word that comes to my mind is disciplined. They were really just at a point where, oh, like, yeah. hey, we need to use teamwork. We need to make sure that we stay back here. Here's a point where we engage. We're stronger here. They knew every avenue of power they had in a certain scenario, and they totally utilized it. And I think the thing that uh, really sticks out about Tomb of the Spider Queen when compared to other maps, it's the sort of map where there's just lots of persistent team fight opportunities. Sure. And I mean, the caution from Arizona State University, <clears throat> excuse me, was fantastic. Really only doing hard engages when Diablo could use overpower to pick off a key target. Yeah, <laughs> you've got to squash that little voice that says, we're doing awesome. We are awesome. We can't <laughs> lose a fight. And yeah. for Texas A&M, they had ways to fight a lot of fights. It's with the Devouring Maul. Zagara is a main initiator, initiator for them. And unfortunately, some of the mauls that she did pull off weren't the best. We got one or two heroes. Normally, when you do go into that type of scenario and you want to use Devouring Maul, you want to section off a, a heavy damage user or pick up two to three members. And we'll go into a couple of replays and show you that there were a couple of good scenarios overall, but it wasn't the best that we could have seen from Texas A&M. This will have to be the first one here. They're under a heavy lot of pressure. Can we get a pause, Jake, really quickly here? Um, from the entire map, uh, if we go ahead and pull that up, we actually can see uh, there was actually a lot of pressure coming from the red side here uh, from um, our red team. Actually, let's go ahead and show you. There we go, the red team. I want to get all nice and spiffy here as we have a lot of pressure coming in. And it's on Gosan here to be really, really aggressive with grabbing someone in the Devouring Mall. She wants to potentially, if possible, get these two members, Rhaegar and Jaina, just because they bring in a lot of damage and a lot of healing. Unfortunately, she was only, only able to grab one member here, which is decent, and they're able to get a clear up. Can we go and get a play here, Jake? We'll see that they will pick off a couple of members, and it's important here for Michael Udall, the uh, Jaina up here in the top right corner, to actually jump on top of Sylvanas and try and take her out. So we're going to go ahead and watch the match here. As we'll see, it looks like Fam is going to be picked off, so a decent pickup and great uh, denial of the heal. But you see in this top left corner, can we get a pause real quick? Uh, we can actually see that uh, Revenge did get away as Nearly was able to heal him up. Nearly, the Brightwing was able to stay on top of Sylvanas. So if that had um, been a solid trade here for Arizona State, um, they would have been in position. But Texas A&M, they need to make sure that when they go in for the engagement, that they get a few members up here in the top right corner whenever they go for the full engagement. And we'll go ahead and go to the replay number two here um, where we actually see the red team. Um, yeah, we're going to go ahead and... We'll go ahead and go to the uh, replay in a second here. Uh, but really, the red team, um, they start to really catch on to this type of play that's coming from Texas A&M. Oh, okay, they want to section this off. So we're now into uh, the second replay right away. We have a lot of pressure going on in all three maps. And we need Texas A&M to go for the engagement. But they they go for it right away. Can we get a pause really, really quickly right after the next force fall here in a couple of seconds? You see... They just went in for the fight. They had an amazing force wall from Kotank that was around this area, sectioned off a member, and we see the uh, huge Hentron Blast from FAM taking out two members. This negates any type of engagement that can happen from Texas A&M because they're behind in numbers now, five to four. So um, overall, Arizona, Arizona State realized the strategy for Texas A&M and never gave them an opportunity to keep following up, especially after that first one. Yeah, I mean, there's some especially nice subtlety there where yeah. you just saw they're a little bit more spread. Just to make sure just Devouring Maul yeah. just a little didn't bit. do anything too massive. And I mean, it's very, very subtle. But once you start looking for it, you'll see that uh, against Zagar, really, really well-coordinated teams will be just a little bit farther from each other, meaning that only one target can really get picked up at any point in time. Yeah, yeah. because anytime the Zagara casts that Devouring Maul, there's a little indicator where it's going to land. But you don't have seconds to react. It happens really fast. If you have a lot of space around you, you can sidestep it to a degree if you're not caught smack in the center. But by creating that little bit more space between each other, they can more easily dodge it, and it becomes difficult for uh, Zagara to land it. One thing I noticed that last week, Ghost Sun was playing the support 
Now he's playing Zagara, and I, I wonder whether maybe that is uh, a little bit making him less comfortable in landing <laughs> those clutch Devouring Maws. Yeah, because really, the entire team's strategy hinges on that Devouring Maw hitting. Yes. <laughs> early game, he plays Zagara well. Creep Tumors everywhere, holding yeah. down the bottom lane. They got a fort early, but into the mid to late game, you got to carry that playing well all the way through the game, or of course you'll see what we just saw there, where a team that is very coordinated can take you down. Yeah, and I mean, Texas A&M, of course, very low on the specialist count. This is new for them as well. Can the underdogs Texas A&M be able to tie the series up one and one, or will Arizona State University continue their undefeated streak? We'll find out after this, stay tuned.